implications and how that relates to my department. That ends the period for listed questions. And we now move to an urgent oral question. Mr Chris Little has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for Education. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who has tabled, tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clark, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Education for an update on his department's guidance to schools regarding the COVID-19 outbreak. I call Minister for Education. I thank the member for his question. I appreciate this is a very challenging time for schools and all our partners in the education sector. I would like to place on record uh, that I pay tribute to school principals, teachers, classroom assistants and all those working so hard and with such dedication in the wider educational sector at this challenging time. The position on COVID-19 is an exceptionally fast moving uh, and there are new developments are emerging on a daily basis. I recognise and share the genuine fears and concerns that people have, I think that all of us have. Our priority at this, this time must be public health and saving lives. That is why I will continue to follow the expert uh, medical and scientific advice from the Chief Medical Officer, the Public Health Agency, uh, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies and indeed wider advice given by Government. Schools will continue to remain open until such time as this expert scientific advice changes. In the events of schools having to close, my priority is that uh, teaching and learning continue. It is not a question of when schools close, this will be effectively an extended holiday. And that is particularly true for those who have GCSE or A-level examinations. My department has put in place arrangements to work closely with all its education partners in a range of very complex issues arising from the uh, coronavirus outbreak, including the Education Authority on Service Delivery Issues and the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessment on Examination Issues. I will ensure that there are appropriate contingency plans are in place and that schools are regularly updated with appropriate advice as the situation evolves. Uh, my department uh, convened a COVID-19 education planning group on the 13th of March to coordinate efforts across the education sector, and this group will meet on a regular basis to consider and to respond to issues arising. I am aware of the importance of regular, clear and reliable uh, information. I issued guidance to all schools in education settings earlier today. This guidance will be updated on an ongoing basis as new information becomes available and decisions are taken. I also wish to re-emphasise the need for schools to consider public health agency advice. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The coronavirus is an unprecedented public health challenge. We're asking the people and school leaders of Northern Ireland to be alert, not alarmed. They are asking us for clear, measured leadership and guidance. Can I ask the Education Minister, therefore, for a fuller explanation of the expert clinical advice informing his approach to school closures? The guidance he is offering to protect immunosuppressed pupils in special schools and his plans to sustain childcare provision in the event of the COVID-19 outbreak. Picking up I think, on a number of those, those questions, in terms of the expert advice, I have the opportunity, indeed, having spoken directly uh, previously to the Chief Medical Officer, and I will try and keep uh, updated flow of communication. Chief Medical Officer on Thursday, whenever the position had changed in the Republic of Ireland, gave clear advice to the executive members, um, which was then, I think, relayed as part of the, the press conference afterwards. Uh, the concern of the Chief Medical Officer, um, and rightly so, is that we have the right interventions at the right time that make the biggest difference. Um, that may well mean that at a future stage we face uh, school closures, but his advice was very clear-cut that this is not the time uh, that school closures should be uh, brought into effect. Uh, in particular, I think the concerns will arise that uh, if we close simply across the board um, in terms of schools, that will take out about a third of a million uh, children. That will have implications in terms of the parental care that will need to be given. And in particular, that will mean that large numbers of parents who are involved in frontline medical services and emergency services are taken away from that at exactly the point at which this needs to be uh, fought. 
Uh, it is also the case that if we're looking at care responsibilities, that uh, there will need to be a, a situation where a lot of uh, grandparents will take on that role who are, I think, widely considered to be the most vulnerable group. Uh, as regards the medical side of it, again, I'm liaising with the Chief Medical Officer, and indeed had hoped to speak to him uh, prior to this, but is involved with the, the COBRA meeting. And I know that the Chief Medical Officer and PHA are looking at the specific advice for medically vulnerable children, and that may well be that that moves in a different uh, sphere to the broader position as regards schools. If we're in a position that there is closure in terms of uh, schools, that will also impact on both youth facilities and childcare. One of the things I am looking to see is if there are any measures that if we move to that point, that there can be something done in terms of childcare, which in particular tries to mitigate some of the, the issues, particularly as regards those, those key workers. And there's a range of preparations that are, that are ongoing. Call Robin Newton. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his uh, answers so far? The Minister has said that he, in the event that schools may close, that he would be basing that on the expert advice that is, that is offered to him. In, in the context that the expert advice says, yes, close the schools, could I ask the Minister how he might, what would be the method of contacting the principal? What would he expect the principal to do with the information? Or would he get that out to parents? And indeed, what would be the kind of plan at that stage? In relation, to, I think there's a number of aspects that the member has raised. Obviously, clearly, we would be communicating with principals, and indeed, there's a C2K system which enables then all schools to be to be directly contacted. Uh, it is also the case that I think it would be wrong when we reach the point at which it, it is then moving towards closure of schools that this is simply sprung on schools. So I would look to see a situation, I think, that we need, even when we're in a position to make that, to give some level of notice to people. So it's not a question of an announcement at lunchtime and closure by, that, uh, by the end of close of play. So there's got to be perhaps at least, say, 48 hours notice uh, for schools. That also applies to parents uh, as well. I think there's preparation work because, again, there's perhaps a misconception uh, that by closing schools, we are ending education. It is, it is the case that remote learning and indeed preparation needs to go on and that teaching will go on. That will be prioritised, particularly on those for examination subjects and indeed throughout the school system, depending upon the capacity uh, to, uh, to cope. So all those issues, I think, have got to be taken into account um, when decisions are, are being made. I don't want to spring anything as a surprise. What I would say is, and I suspect we are still some distance away from reaching the point of closure of schools, but there is also a position, I think, today that for schools, for parents, they need at this point to be thinking ahead that if we reach a point at which schools are closed, what are the arrangements they are going to put in place, particularly for parents for their own, uh, for their own children? I think uh, that is something I think is, is critical and people should be exercising their minds to that at, at present. Iram Sir Karen Mullen for your cash. I call Karen Mullen for a question. Karen Mullen, last can call her. Minister, over the last number of days, um, I, yourself, and everyone in this chamber has been inundated um, by, by school leaders, trade unions, and others in relation to closing. Today, we are now hearing of confirmed cases of pupils um, who have been diagnosed. In my city, the council, community sector, and business sector have led the way. They have closed facilities and businesses, and yet we have children still attending school along with a large workforce. We also have people who live in Donegal and work or attend school in Derry crossing the border. It just doesn't make sense. So I wanted to ask, can the Board of Governors of Schools make the decision to close the schools, and will there be any repercussions? Today we're here and a third of pupils have turned up, so parents have already taken action um, themselves. And Minister, we live here in a small island with many different variables in people's lives. We need urgent and decisive action on school closures today. I appreciate that was perhaps more of a, a speech than a question, but I'll, I'll try and deal with it as, as best I can. Can I say, first of all, yes, uh, there's a different approach being taken in the Republic of Ireland. In part, that has been driven by some of the circumstances in the Republic of Ireland. There is less opportunity in the Republic of Ireland to close individual schools. And, um, there has also been a case that in the Republic of Ireland there have been a range of geographical spikes, so their position is not quite the same. Let me make it absolutely clear, this is not a political issue. If it means that from that point of view that Northern Ireland 
either in terms of timing or actions, takes a different position from either the Republic of Ireland or Great Britain. If that is on the basis of what the medical advice is, I will follow that, that advice. Because my only consideration, this is a global tragedy which is, is coming. We do not know whose family this will, will, this will hit. And at the end of this, I want to be absolutely certain that we have done all that we can and taken the right steps to minimise the tragedies that are facing different families from whatever, whatever community. That's why I'll continue to follow the uh, scientific ad advice uh, throughout. Iram, sir, Justin McNulty for your cash. I call Justin McNulty for. Guru, my August last count, Carla. Um, firstly, can I thank the principals and teachers for the dignified and calm approach they have adopted making decisions in relation to the unprecedented crisis we are now facing, that is COVID 19. Can the Minister please explain to me how the expert advice is so different between Cross Midlane and Castle Blaney? I'd indicated to the, the member uh, that uh, there is a different position in the Republic of Ireland. They have a different health system. We've also got to take a look at what the implications for our health system uh, if we take large numbers of staff out of that at, at present. I've indicated to him that they're part of closed schools on a, a slightly different basis from in the Republic of Ireland and that indeed they face geographical spikes. Look, you may say at some stage we will face a situation in which there's a difference between uh, Larne and Stranraer, which are only a, a number of miles apart in relation to it. You know, the reality is this is not a situation. We have to take a situation in which what is best for the public health in Northern Ireland in relation to that. If we try and do this through the prism of a border, and indeed we've seen a situation that throughout Europe there's been a range of different approaches that have been taken. There's a difference between Germany and Denmark, which shares a border between Germany and France, between Spain and Portugal, between Austria and Italy. I could go on. We have got to take the professional advice. If we take a different approach to the chief medical officer, who is the principal person giving that scientific, professional medical advice, then I think that would be highly irresponsible. It would be wrong. It would be dangerous. And it risks the number of deaths that we will almost inevitably see in Northern Ireland being greater. That is why that will be the golden thread that will run through this. It is about taking that clear-cut medical advice. I call Alan Chambers. Minister, uh, you're coming under a lot of pressure to replicate the, the, the closing of schools as undertaken by the Republic of Ireland. Uh, would you be in a position to confirm uh, that their decision was taken on the heels of uh, generic advice that they received from the European Centre for Disease Control? And I'll quote two, two, two paragraphs from that document. It says, the impact of generalised school closures is limiting the progress of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic is uncertain. And they also say that therefore proactive school closure should be carefully considered in the context of a series of other prevention and mitigation layers to reduce the transmission of the disease, weighing the expected impact of the epidemic against the adverse effects of such closures on the community. Could I remind the member, the there's a question in there, please. And there's a lot of our members trying to, to get in. If members could be concise and sharpen their question. Was the member, had the member asked his question? Yeah, I have already asked. Was he aware that that, that was what they based their decision on? Well, look, I, I think the decisions taken in the Republic of Ireland are obviously, a, for a sovereign government, they've got to take their own decision. I, I indicated that the positions are different between Northern Ireland and the uh, Republic of Ireland. It is also the case, and any expert medical advice will say that when we reach the point at which schools close, it will have to be for a very extended period. Therefore, I was very surprised that the position in the Republic of Ireland indicated that it was a two-week closure, because that will, not, that will not wash this out of the system. When closures do happen, they will be for the rest of the, of the academic year, for the full term. And so therefore, we've actually got to look at what, not simply the implications for a two-week period, where people may be able to make particular arrangements for a fortnight, but actually what happens over the months to come. Look, none of us should delude ourselves that when it comes to coronavirus, this is something which is going to be entirely a short-term situation. This is going to be something that it will be with us potentially for months to come. And therefore, there has got to be a sustained and long-term uh, response to that. Call Rachel Woods. 
Notwithstanding the clear need to address plans for the schools and our children there, as, the ch as well as those providing childcare, I would like to ask the Minister about the community and voluntary sector engaged in providing after school clubs, detached youth work, and children and family mental health services. I am aware of one letter that has been issued by the Education Authority to the youth service providers on Friday. And it's this letter it was stated that educational visits were to be immediately postponed to September. Does the Minister believe that this is satisfactory? And what communication plan has been put together by the Department for Youth Services and Youth Community and Voluntary Sector in order to let them know and keep them updated on their services and what they should do? Taking fits and closure of schools, that will actually have implications uh, for youth services as well. This is part of a blanket situation. You know, there's no point, for example, if we are saying that we reach the point at which the Chief Medical Officer says that we shouldn't be gathering children together in schools, but children can gather together in youth services, so it's got to be something that, that's, that's uniform in relation to it. I think there has been some good work, and I think youth service have, have proved um, very helpful and productive in terms of some of the thoughts that are ongoing, for instance, in terms of uh, between ourselves, communities, and the Department of Health on how we can tackle the issue of uh, the issue of, of providing meals, for instance, as we move towards the free school meals situation. So I think there's a productive role that needs to be uh, done there. We'll be happy to engage with that, particularly as regards uh, Education Authority. They are one I mentioned earlier about the, um, the cross-sectoral group, which involves the various sectors, but also particularly EA, uh, involves CCA, which is meeting on a regular basis. So obviously they will have direct input in terms of youth services as well. And it's important, if you like, that that's, uh, all our facilities are, are made available. Uh, I mentioned in terms of the, um, for example, the advice given to schools, that is publicly available. It's on the, should be on the departmental website and um, will presumably, may well also then be a known and direct. So it will be accessible in that regard. But it's important that, that as much information is got out to as many people as possible. Call Jim Allister. Okay. Uh, can the Minister confirm and be very clear that the professional medical advice which caused the executive collectively to decide last Thursday not to close schools, that that professional advice has not changed. And if that is correct, is there any escaping the conclusion that Sinn Féin's decision to rat on that decision is entirely political? I can, I can confirm that the medical evidence that was given was given directly by the Chief Medical Officer to the Executive. Uh, along with officials and indeed from different ministers. I was present in the room whenever he gave it. I heard it first hand. That is the position in which the executive uh, reached. Um, there has been no change in terms of the chief medical officer's uh, opinion, as opposed to what uh, others in terms of change of their position. I think that's really for them uh, to explain. Adam, sir, Jerry Carroll is on your case. I call so Jerry Carroll. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister not realise that schools are, some schools are already closed at the minute and that his department is acting too slow to deal with this crisis? The advice across the globe is that early intervention works and it needs to happen here as well. The advice of the Chief Medical Officer, and I wasn't aware that the Honourable Member for West Belfast was a virologist, um, the um, advice of the Chief Medical Officer is to have the right interventions at the right time which have the maximum impact. He has given direct advice that now is not the time to be closing uh, schools. Now, some schools may well take particular courses of action. I, I appreciate that. Um, but in the same way as I think there's a duty on all of us to behave as responsibly as possible. And some people, you know, when you get a crisis situation, sometimes it brings the worst and, the, uh, and sometimes the best out of people on it. I think we need to create a situation which we're all pulling in the same direction. The key test for this should be the impact on public health, because we don't know this can impact on, on everybody, and there is an uh, expectation that before this is over, this will impact on a very large number of people. So my key consideration, and I will be guided by that medical scientific advice, is, and I keep on coming back to this, what is the key thing which actually will, will limit um, the number of deaths? And if you make, for instance, too early an intervention, that can actually have an impact in terms of, for example, the, the spike of, of cases. That may actually simply create a wave which pushes us into a main point in uh, September, October time. We're perhaps less able to cope with it. So all these things are carefully worked out, uh, and I think everybody is trying to take all the action to diminish this as much as possible. Call Claire Sugden. Deputy Speaker, um, 
Can I ask the Minister to detail the rationale of the anticipated up to 16 week closure suggested by the First Minister at the North South Ministerial Council at the weekend and how that will impact on students studying for qualifications and if indeed they will be able to conclude those? Uh, two things in terms of that. The, that is based again on the medical advice. I think previously I had been in a session where I think there was a, the Chief Medical Officer about a minimum of 13 weeks. Uh, from a practical point of view, if you are going to um, have a level of quarantining period, um, then it's going to be something which, if you do it simply for two weeks, you're simply stalling the problem and then releasing the same people back out there. It's, it, 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 you know, I think the, the clear medical evidence that if something is needed to be done, it will need to be done for a considerable period of time. Uh, the member asked a very good question in terms of qualifications. We're working closely with CCEA uh, on that. There is a wider context, uh, which is that CCEA need to plug into the broad exam regulator, and there will also be there is work ongoing as well with uh, qualification boards from England and Wales, because particularly around about 15%, particularly for our A-level students, take English qualifications. So there's got to be, if you like, a, a wider uh, UK-wide uh, response. I'm confident that we will reach a situation in which, one way or the other, qualifications will be able to happen. There's different routes to which that can take place. Because of, I think, the wider UK context, particularly as regards A-levels, on, on GCSEs, I think something around about 97 or 98 per cent of GCSEs come through CCEA, and there's less of a direct problem in Northern Ireland because of our linear progression mode. Um, but there will be a range of options that will have to be agreed, and probably on a UK-wide basis, some of which will be in conjunction with the universities. So there are different options in terms of, I think, the ideal situation we reached a point in which students are simply able to sit their exams. We may look at issues around predicted grades or indeed later sittings. And the universities themselves may be responsive to this in terms of later start dates uh, within that, because obviously the grades that people receive would be critical to what, whether they get a university place, where they get it, and what course they, they get on. Call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that it's important at a time of genuine national crisis that members of this House do not engage in behaviours that are likely to cause panic. I refer specifically to the member for Upper Ban, Mr O'Dowd, who used social media to accuse the government of engaging in a twisted medical experiment. And I also refer, I also refer, Order. I also Order, please. refer to the member for Foyle, uh, Mrs Anderson, who was directly tweeting at the health minister. Now, does the member agree that actions like that will cause simply panic in our society and we cannot engage in them? Look, I think this is a time... Uh, look, it is it's deeply... It is obvious that a lot of people and all of us share deep concerns, fears that are there. This is a time, though, as much as possible for uh, calm heads, for not sort of engaging in colourful language which could exacerbate the situation, and also doing uh, anything and avoiding anything which creates panic in our society. We've seen that, um, for example, unfortunately, in terms of some of the panic that is out there. Anybody, for instance, going around a lot of our large shops will see the, the impact of panic bulk buying, which is not only unnecessary, but is deeply selfish, for example, which may well deprive um, elderly people, vulnerable people, of some of the things they do actually need, and actually people taking levels of supplies which they could never get through. So I think there's a, a task on all of us to ensure that we moderate our language and that uh, this is done in a measured and calm way, given the scale of the crisis, not simply happening here, but throughout the world. Here I'm Sir Catherine Kelly for your case. I call Catherine Kelly for Minister, today we have been informed that the Education Authority has directed its staff that they are to postpone training in schools, educational conferences postponed, and educational welfare officers have been told no home visits. Was this a directive from the Department, and why is there a difference in the approach to school-based staff and pupils? Is their health more important than the children? Frankly, everybody's health is important. But it is also the case, and I suppose in direct answer, the EA will obviously deal with its, its own situations. And I think that where there's unnecessary visits, I don't, you know, that's something which I think all of us could agree on, unnecessary gatherings shouldn't necessarily happen on that basis. One of the differences, I suppose, is, and one of the implications, if we're looking, for instance, the whole school closure, 
is the impact that that will have in terms of care responsibilities on parents. Now, if, for example, you have a situation in which uh, a group of adults are not going to meet another group of adults, that has no particular implication, for instance, for frontline medical services. Taking a third of a million <coughs> children out of school, relying then on their parents to be able to um, uh, look after them, come out of their own job, create their own uh, care responsibilities in that regard, will have a major impact in terms of the, the ability of the health service, the emergency services to be able to deal with this. That's why I think the two are completely different situations. Here Mr. Daniel McCrossan for your case. Call Daniel McCrossan for questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answer to his question so far. Uh, Minister, I think it's safe to say across this House that teachers, principals and parents are absolutely already panicking regardless of what is happening uh, on social media or uh, from this House. And they're panicking simply because they see a lack of direction in relation to this very important issue. There's many parents, Minister, that have already taken their children out of school because they're severe, very, very concerned for their child's well-being. What, what will happen, Minister, if you're so adamant and set against closing these schools? What will happen to those parents who make that decision in the interest of their children's health? I've already indicated that we're working with the CMO where there is particular... Uh, medical issues, and I think there will be advice that will that will issue in, in relation to that. Uh, look, if we're talking about panicking, unfortunately we've seen, as I indicated, at different levels in our society, panic. I think, as a responsible body, we can either try to provide calm leadership and to try to provide reassurance, or we can fuel that panic. And unfortunately, there's too many people who hold positions of responsibility who are helping to fuel that panic today. Uh, so. That is, I think, the level of responsibility that we need to uh, adopt within this. We need calm heads. We need to ensure that we don't get that panic being exacerbated. Call Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, just want to place on record my thanks to the Minister for coming to, uh, to us this afternoon at such short notice, and also to go on record and say thank you uh, for behaving in the manner that you have, along with the Health Minister and being so stoic in the face of such pressure. <clears throat> I speak as one, Mr. Speaker, 16 years emergency planning experience. I know there's lots of experts in here on virology and, and, and viruses and stuff, but I just want to commend you for your approach to emergency planning. Um, has the Minister given any thought to what or how difficult a start-up might look like, given that we are likely to see closures in the region of 14 to 16 weeks? Uh, how, how difficult a start-up might be with a, a gap of 14 to 16 no, weeks? No, I mean, the, the, there will be a range of challenges. I think, the, the, broadly speaking, if we're looking at a lengthy uh, closure, uh, I, as I said, I want to make it clear that the, the emphasis on those circumstances will be on ensuring as much as possible that teaching and learning continues. This is not simply a question of sending children home, that they won't be carrying on with schoolwork as much as possible. There is a major challenge across the board uh, that, for example, in terms of remote learning, um, the C2K system to be able to deal with uh, a third of a million children might have greater difficulty, in which case there will be prioritisation uh, of that. Look, there's undoubtedly the case that, that we need to actually have planning which will operate over a longer period of time. Uh, so that will be the challenge. And I, I would say uh, the member has a great deal of experience in terms of emergency planning. It is good uh, to hear from an expert in this, uh, in this chamber. For, for a question. Um, I'd just like to ask the minister, or actually, do you know what? I'll declare an interest first. I'm a mummy of a 16-year-old who's going through her AS levels, and I sent my child to school because I'm trusting the chief medical officer and I'm trusting the way forward. But I would like to commend those teachers who are trying to prepare ahead. We are roughly seven, eight weeks out from GCSEs, ASs and A2s. What I would like to ask the Minister, as you've already alluded to, you started to allude to, is the problem of C2K. Not all parents can afford to buy tablets or have phones and things that, that teachers can work with. Given the stress that it causes pupils for exams, can you explain how quickly that those plans will be in place to help our teachers to be able to deliver a satisfactory outcome for those children who are trying to go their best to go through exams? I think the, uh, the member makes a very valid point. First of all, in terms of materials, I think we will need to work in a slightly mixed economy while C2K will be the principal role. There will be some who will not have access in terms of internet. Uh, and indeed, uh, with the rollout for instance, of broadband, there will some will be in physical situations. So that will need to be worked through. There is a, at present a level of trialling going on in terms of C2K to see what level of reach can be produced within that. In circumstances in which uh, that is not able to be delivered for everyone, uh, the key prioritisation will be on those going through those key examinations. There will be a level of prioritisation 
to A level, to GCSE and AS level. In terms of some of the arrangements for examinations, there are, as I said, a range of options. We are, as I said, in a better position in Northern Ireland uh, because of the way I feel like we structure our courses. But because there's an implication for um, a reasonable number of our pupils uh, who are following, for instance, um, examination boards that are outside of Northern Ireland, I want to be in a position that we get an, an overall solution to that rather than try to announce a particular route, which may change in any event, that we, a particular route that is announced, which for the sake of argument might impact on 90% of those doing exams, but then leaves those 10% sort of wondering. So I want to give a, bit, a full picture to people. That concludes this item of business. Thank you, Minister. Um, as Claire Sugden has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for the Economy, I would remind members again that if they wish to ask any supplementary question, they should raise continue.